Forward together, not one step back. We welcome you to the third National Moral Monday March and call in on Mitch McConnell because of the meanness, the misery, and the mayhem that he is creating. And we won't allow him to hide any more, not one, not one more second. Somebody, he's been hurting our people and it's gone on far too long. We won't be silent anymore. We want you to know that on this video, on this uh, 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 play, at this place, we believe in forward together, not one step back. And so go get your friend, tweet somebody, Instagram somebody, uh, call somebody, tell them to join. We, we or the last two Mondays, we've had over a half million people to join. Thousands and thousands of people have called in to shut down Mitch McConnell's office and to challenge him, challenge him to pass a just and comp comp uh, uh, compassionate uh, Heroes Act and Cares Act to stop hurting people, stop hurting poor people and low income people and working people and people without health care. And today we're going to call on him to to fix what's going on with the United States Post Office. The, he could stop it. It's not Trump and his uh, secretary, his crony alone. Mitch McConnell, as majority leader, has the power, majority leader of the Senate, to stop it. He and Nancy Pelosi could join together and stop it. She's ready. He's not. Even if she wasn't ready, he could do it. That's the kind of power that he had. He could make one phone call to the, to the president and say, stop it. But he hides underneath. He hides underneath. And the folk from Kentucky said, we need to do more Monday on Mitch McConnell and pull him from underneath the covers. We need to expose what is going on, his mayhem, his meanness, and, and the misery that he's, that, that he's causing. So before we even do that, we have the power. We just did a report that shows the power that poor and low wealth uh, people have all over this country. And in every state, even in Kentucky, in Kentucky, if just a few percentage point of poor and low wealth people increase their voting and around issues, not around necessarily a personality, but around issues, they can fundamentally shift the political calculus in this country. They can send some people home for vacation. We don't endorse, but we certainly tell people the power that they have. We may not, we, we don't endorse and say vote for this candidate, but on this, on this live stream, we will tell on a candidate all day long so that you can make your decision. And the, guess what the focus is? Guess what the curriculum is? It's not but one issue on the curriculum. Every time we do this tomorrow, Monday night, and that's Mitch McConnell and his mayhem, his meanness, and his and the misery that he's calling that we have to stop. But before we get there any further, check out this interview we did with Al Shibelsi, uh on MSNBC that shows the power that poor and low wealth people have and get some other folks to come on and join. We're going to have a powerful outline today, a powerful group of guests. Check this out. Organizers and political leaders have been working on getting Americans out to vote for decades now, pouring their energy into drawing out the young voter, the suburban voter, the first-time voter, the elderly, and to a degree it's worked. But despite that effort, there are still large blocks of Americans, eligible Americans, who don't vote and are often not encouraged to do so. Poor and low-income Americans are quite often uh, a neglected and ignored voter block. But with over 140 Americans in poverty, they're a group that could hold immense power. According to a study by the Poor People's Campaign in 2016, if poor and low-income voters would have turned out at the same rate as higher-income voters, the results in 15 states could have flipped. Because while 29 million low-income voters did cast ballots, another 34 million eligible low-income voters did not. That makes their turnout rate 20% lower than higher-income voters. That's 15 states that could have flipped. Now, as we head into the 2020 election, it's critical that amid a recession, amid racial strife and consistent defunding of our social safety net programs, poor people get a voice. My next guest has been at the forefront of the work to build up that coalition. He's got a plan to make it happen. I'm joined by the Reverend Dr. William Barber. He's the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, the president of Repairers of the Breach, and co-author of Revive Us Again, Vision and Action on uh, in Moral Organizing. Uh, Reverend Dr. Barber, good to see you again. I mean, here's the thing. When we talk about the voiceless, the least among us, uh, we're actually talking about uh, poor people in America. The reason they're not targeted to vote is because they're not subject to anybody's advertising. They don't, uh, nobody looks for them. They don't have sway. They don't make donations. Uh, and, and to the point we just made, they've not got a history of voting. So they tend to be fully ignored. How do we change that systemically so that they're actually part of the conversation? 
Well, Ali, a lot of times the reason people have not voted, number one, is the voter suppression that goes on particularly among poor people, poor African-American, poor Latinos, and then it impacts poor white people as well. But also, as we've crisscrossed the country, a lot of poor and lower people never hear their issue. Uh, they never hear the things that they're concerned about, really talking to them and lifting them up. What they're starting to say across this country, that's not going to be no longer. The, the rallying cry now is we must do more. We must shift this narrative. We must be a power. And, and we saw it happen in Kentucky. Some of it's happened in New Mexico. I've seen it happen in North Carolina. The, the Senate, uh, Alshie, for instance, is in play. And poor people and low-income people have the power to make the play. You mentioned those 15 states. It would take less than 20 percent. In some of those states, it's 1 percent. All of them are battle state, battleground state. One percent change in poor and low-income voting in Michigan could flip it. Nineteen percent change in North Carolina. Something like six percent change in Georgia. And so what poor and low-wealth people are saying, we're no longer going to wait on people to speak our issues. We have an agenda for the healing of the nation. We're going to vote in mass. We're going to change this narrative, and, and we're going to be a force to re be reckoned with. And this report shows the kind of force it, they can be, and that it's really political malpractice and political suicide not to reach out to, listen to this, Alshie, 25 percent of the voting population, 25 percent of the electorate are poor and low wealth. Over 140 million people are poor and low wealth before COVID, going over 175 million in COVID. It is not only immoral, it is impractical. It makes no political sense to leave poor and low wealth people off the table. You, you, one of the things that you want to do is change the way the Democratic Party gets poor people registered to vote. What does that involve? Well, one of the things we're doing is we're having a massive campaign that's entitled MORE, mobilizing, organizing, registering, educating people for the movement who vote. And even beyond partisans, we're nonpartisan. What we're saying is we must mobilize people around issues. Dr. King told us in 65, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, that, that every time there's a lot of division and blocking and suppression of vote, it's the fear of extremists, the fear of the, of, the, of, of the aristocracy, of poor and low wealth, white and black people coming together and change. He saw that in 65. Surely we can see it in 2020. So we're saying to the, the Democratic Party, make sure there's a prominent place. You cannot ignore it. I personally, we personally in the movement think it's a problem to open your convention, for instance, with John Casey, who has had a history of doing policies against the poor welfare reform, uh, uh, pushing voter suppression. Open it with poor and low wealth people of every race, creed, and color. Let them tell their story. Make sure they're at the table, because that's what this is really about. That's what really has to happen in this moment. And the question for the Democratic Party or any party is, can you resist the labels of left versus right and focus on our moral center and economic justice? Because there's this whole group of people, 25 percent of the electorate, are saying that no longer will we be quiet anymore. Reverend Dr. William Barber, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, thank you for joining me, sir, on the work that you're doing to get poor people uh, into, the full, uh, into the political system as full participants. No longer will we be quiet anymore. 25 percent of the electorate poor and low-wealth people. We also know that in these states, less than 20% of poor and low-wealth people organized around an agenda, an agenda that's contrary to what McConnell is pushing, could fundamentally change the Senate, change the presidency, change government, governor races. And that's why today, though, we're focused on Mitch McConnell. I'm repping my fraternity. My fraternity is the one that Martin Luther King was a part of. And, you know, Martin Luther King talked about racism, poverty and militarism. In the Poor People's Campaign, we talk about systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And Liz, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris is going to come on in just a bit to talk about that. But in all of our issues, Mitch McConnell is on the other side. He is what he called himself the Grim Reaper. He is causing so much mehab and misery in this country, and it's time for us to call him out. Go to the screen or go to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org and call his office and tell other people. We also want to focus on this post office issue. And we have no better person to talk about it than Elizabeth Powell. Elizabeth Powell is the secretary treasurer of the Ameri uh, uh, American Postal Workers Union. I'm an honorary member. She knows Liz. She loves us. She loves this movement. She's so serious about this. 
She said, I might be riding in a car, but I need to be on today to tell you all what's really going on and why Mitch McConnell is actually abdicating his responsibility. He is an enabler of everything that Trump talks about. In fact, Mitch McConnell in some ways is more dangerous because he actually had the ability to pass laws to implement the words and the craziness and the antics of Trump. So Sister Paul, talk to us why postal workers are fighting why we need to be concerned and tell us what's happening what's the ugly side what's really going on in the in the post offices and why must we take this issue up is she still on i know she was trying to get on yeah i'm here there she is go ahead it would always help if you take yourself off of mute thank That's you right. Barbara, and good afternoon everyone it's really an honor to be part of this panel this afternoon. And Reverend Barber is right. We got a problem with Mitch McConnell. He's been holding back everything that helped the post office and postal workers from day one. When we talk about voter suppression, this is exactly what this is doing for How are you supposed to we got a little audio. Hold on just a second, Sister Powell. Well, you might need to put your uh, video off and just come in on audio. So yeah, just come in on audio and put it as close to your mouth as possible so we can hear you. There we go. Now talk to us. All right. All of a sudden now, voter fraud, voter fraud. The post office is consists of about 40% diverse workers. How do he think that makes the work still to make them think that they can't do their job and get these mail-in ballots back on time. He's running scared. We all know that. Mitch McConnell will not sit down with Nancy Pelosi to negotiate a bill that's worthy of it. She's calling all of the members back in this Monday, this week, to try to work out something once again. Now, he's saying he will not give the post office $25 million because that will only encourage the, the voters to vote. Well, what does he think? You know, the pandemic set us all back. The mail volume is low. Postal workers are working hard, depend, you know, risking their health as well as the health of their families. They need the money to survive. A lot of people don't know that tax dollars do not go to fund the post office. The post office is funded from the revenue that comes in. But if there's no revenue coming in, then the post office can't be funded. We need Mitch McConnell sit down with Nancy Pelosi and negotiate a bill, a Heroes Act, whatever. The stimulus package that they started on before had the 25 million that was needed in it. Trump said he would not sign it. Now he uh -huh. said he would not sign another one. They wanna take it apart and make it be a separate part and don't wanna put it as part of the big package. We know what he did with the $600 that was supposed to go to the um, people that were unemployed. He wants to cut that down to $400, $400, anything they want to cut. Get rid of Mitch McConnell, get rid of Donald Trump. Let's take America back. That's right. And Sister Powell, you're exactly right. $25 billion. They gave one and a half trillion dollars to the corporations that didn't even go through Congress. One and a half trillion dollars, and they've given some here three trillion dollars to corporations and banks, 83% of the money. And Mitch McConnell said, I'm not passing any bill that doesn't protect the corporations. Now he wants to protect corporations from liability, <laughs> even when they put workers at risk. He wants to cut the unemployment. He wants another 30 billion dollars for an airplane that the Pentagon is not even asking for. Wants another quarter, 250 billion dollars for tax cuts to his, his greedy friends. But then he does not want to protect the post office office and the mail because he does not want people to vote, which is just another form of vote outright voter suppression. In a oh, real so sense, great. this pandemic is exposing the pandemonic. And, and right. this voter suppression is not just hurting black people, it's going to hurt all folks it's in America. It's hurting everybody. Exactly it's hurting everybody, right. Reverend Barber. The veterans will get their medicine through the mail. Our seniors will get their medicine through the mail. They depend on the post office. That's some right. of in some of the rural places, that's all that they have is the post office, and they look for that male right. person every day. So, so it sounds like mess. sounds like as as 
It, no, it is. And we, and, but your union has been fighting against messes and the poor people's campaign knows how to, to deal with messes. First thing you got to do is call out the mess up. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we know that he doesn't, you know, McConnell doesn't even have to pass a bill. He could call President Trump and stop yeah. this. That's what they did to Richard Nixon. The, the, yeah. They went down and they sat with him and said, stop it. And, and, and he had to shift. They said, we're not going to do another thing. So thank you for being on. Listen. Sister Powell wants everybody to call Mitch McConnell. Look at the screen. You can do it or go to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. Am I right about that, Rob? Am I saying it right? Uh, you can go to that one or you can go on the screen to the bit.ly link. Apparently, he's gone on vacation, so he's not even in either of his D.C. offices. We're, we're in Lexington right now, so he's gone home, and we're going to follow him there. Uh, That's today. right. Oh. And call, call the offices because his staff is there. And we want him to know, just like we've done over half a million people have joined us the last two Mondays. We want thousands and thousands or more. We'll give you a count in a minute. We need to make these calls. You need to sign up. We're going to be planning some additional things. I'm going to talk about it when we get to the Kentucky folk in a little bit. But Sister Powell, thank you so much. Keep fighting, my sister. Solidarity and forward together. Not one step. Thank you. Now. Thank you, Reverend Barbara. Tell him to fix it and fix it now. Fix it now. Listen, y'all, you need to know a little bit before Liz comes on about this whole post office business. And, I, and there's an article that came out within Portside. I want to just drop a few, uh, drop some history on you just so we're clear about what's going on. The post office in and of itself was first uh, organized uh, by the colonists. In fact, ben, ben Franklin was the first postmaster general. And the whole point of the post, the post office then was to get stuff to the people that would tell them what the authoritarian government was doing so that they could be informed. It was actually used to help fuel the revolution, the Revolutionary War, if you will. It was actually used to tell the truth on what was happening when rulers were passing down taxation without representation in the American policy. So the post office is supposed to be on the side of liberation and getting stuff to the people. It's not supposed to be used to keep stuff away from people. But when did this change? Is it new with Donald Trump? No, actually Donald Trump in this and Mitch McConnell are, 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 are mimicking Donald Trump's hero, Andrew Jackson. It was Andrew Jackson who had his own issues of racism and his own issues of extremism. He was the one that made the post office secretary general a partisan appointment along with uh, to other appointments, which today gives the president the right to appoint thousands of people, but also gives the right to the Senate, majority leading the Senate, to approve. So when, when and, and, and Andrew Jackson made his person uh, the appointment, he used the postmaster general for his own political purposes. So what Trump and McConnell are doing is they're reaching back in history and doing something that was started with Andrew Jackson. You need to know that because you talk about going back. They are seriously about going backward and they're actually changing the original intent of the post office. And by the way, mail-in ballots is not something new. It actually happened during uh, in the days of the 1700s and 1800s. So, so you all, we need to understand what's going on and we need to push back against it. Now, Liz is on, Reverend Dr. Liz, and she has a message to you why she's on today and calling on us to call Mitch McConnell, jam his line, let his staff know, and get registered to vote. You can do all those things through the site. Reverend Liz, talk to us for a few minutes. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us at this Moral Monday March on McConnell. So hearing from our leader, Liz Powell from the Postal Workers Union, hearing this history that Reverend Barber was just talking about of this postal service, and then also hearing that McConnell and all his staff are on vacation in Washington, D.C., while millions in this country are hurting more than some ever have hurt before, makes me think of one particular passage from the Bible. I think it's a message that Mitch McConnell and Louis DeJoy, the Senate, and all those rich and powerful who are crushing the faces of the poor in this pandemic should uh, hear. Amos 8 says, listen to this, you who walk all over the week, you who treat poor people as less than nothing, who say, when's my next paycheck coming so I can go out and live it up? How long till the weekend when I can go out and have a good time? Who give little and take much, and never do an honest day's work. 
You exploit the poor using them. And then when they're used up, you discard them. Mm. Isn't that something? Amos was writing this 8th century BCE, but his critique of the wealthy and the political leadership of our day, walking on the weak, exploiting the poor, giving little and taking much, doesn't that sound pretty true? As we just heard, the U.S. Postal Service is a bulwark of our democracy. More than 600,000 people working for the post office, its reach in every county in this country, 91% of the U.S. population loving the post office. The post office delivers life-saving medicine to elders. It employs large numbers of black Americans with better wages and working conditions and has since the reconstruction. And in this pandemic, it could literally be a lifesaver to voters who are too sick or too afraid to vote in person. I think Amos speaks to us in this moment and let us have the ears to hear this prophetic call to stop treating people, to stop treating this democracy as less than nothing. Don't use the poor, don't use our postal workers and discard them and then stop taking much from the least of these who are actually really most of us. I also think about how uh, last week Mitch McConnell sent the Senate on vacation without passing a stimulus relief bill that extended unemployment or halted evictions or expanded health care. We have to have a message, a message from the prophets like Amos to folks like McConnell. That message is get back to work, raise wages, lift the load of poverty, spread health care, stop evictions, don't live it up on the backs of the poor of this nation and defend our postal workers. Everybody's got the right to live. Everybody's got the right to living wage jobs and union rights and health care and housing and adequate income and safety. So please, everybody that is with us today, flood those phone lines at McConnell's office. Show your support to our postal workers. Show your support for the democracy that we are fighting for. Let's mobilize and organize, register and educate like our lives depend on it because indeed they do. We thank you for being with us. Please keep on making those calls. Please stand with us, our brothers in Kentucky, our sisters in Kentucky, and our postal workers, and all of those who are hurting in this pandemic. Liz, you're so right. And that's a powerful uh, set of verses from Amos 8, read in the Message Bible. And listen, y'all, we need you to make the calls. Even if it's busy, the calls register. They know we're calling. And it's sending a shockwave uh, throughout the Senate. We are hearing that other people are hearing about this and they're starting to say, look, we got to deal with this because it's becoming a political mess. So call them, call them, and we need to be able to fund the, fund the post office and that same bill needs to do this CARES Act, this HEROES Act, but it needs to do living wages and it needs to do health care and it needs to do sick leave and it needs to make sure people can't be kicked out of their homes and that their mortgages can be uh, forgiven, not just a moratorium, because somebody's, I'm, we're going to next week talk about how if you just do a moratorium, it actually can end up hurting your credit on the long run. We need some forgiveness going on here because what Mitch McConnell has supported, he supported paying the corporation's payroll. He, he supported giving more money to them. He, while 30 million more, more people have been added to the unemployment line and 27 more people have left, lost their health care in the midst of all of this. Vacation? Well, we're not going to take a vacation. We can't take a vacation. This democracy is at stake. And so we need you to call, we need you to sign, and we need you to register to vote. And say, we aren't going to tell you who to vote for. We're going to tell on them. And you can make your decision based on the facts and based on the knowledge. And so we need you to register to vote. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you, Rob, to tell me about how many people are on and the calls that are going in. Now we're going to Kentucky. So those of you in the media, Kentucky is at the forefront of this, the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign. We got Tana Fogel on. We got Pam McMichael on. And, and, but we, and, and in a moment, I'm going to hear from them. But we've got Darling Whitlow from Bowling Green, Kentucky. She's straight up from Bowling Green, Kentucky, retired last year from the post office, member of the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign and works in a food bank. Give us your truth, Darlene. Talk to us about your truth. Thank you for having me on. And um, I just want to say that Mitch McConnell, for as long as he's been in office, 
as the Senate Majority Leader, he's been sabotaging this country and his newest target is the post office. He's trying to commit a new form of voter suppression by not supporting the post office. The post office is something that is very needed in this country. One thing that I did learn about the post office that I didn't know until I got there was that we go door to door. I knew that part, but there are a lot of senior citizens that rely on the post office for That's their right. medicines, getting checks, and just looking forward to getting mail every day or getting something. But the biggest part is that we might be the only contact they have that day if they live alone, if they don't have family members checking on them. And they depend on that. They look forward to just having that one conversation and that little bit of human contact. And now the post office is being sabotaged and um, they're trying to undermine the voting. I do plan on voting by mail myself. I think it's safe and I, I know it's safe because I work there and I know that we could ha handle the volume when I was there. We could handle it now. I keep saying we like I'm still there because it's, you know, it's in my heart. But you know what but, you um, Every day or during election season, we delivered so much political mail to every household every day. And it just keeps coming. We would be in there fussing like, oh, don't vote for him because he's sending out too much stuff. He's getting on our nerves. He's slowing us down. And even though it took time, we did it. We were able to do it. That's and right. Mitch McConnell is saying that this um, $600 bonus, it was a bonus from the Democrats. Like, you know, people didn't need that money. Kentucky is one of the poorest states in the union. And yes, people need that money. They depend on that money. And he's not supporting that now. He wants to cut that back to four hundred dollars. Well, you know, if you he, they're saying that people don't want to go back to work because of this six hundred dollars. And I'm sure there are some people that don't want to go back to work. And who can blame them when you're not getting paid a living wage? And you've been and you're being put at risk and you're not getting the PPEs. And then he wants the corporation to be uh, protected from liability. I mean, you know, exactly. like you said it. Right. That, but and, 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 you know, one of the things you just mentioned is this, this sabotage is creating a suppression of the vote. It's creating he, the McConnell's involved in suppressing the vote. His policies suppress wages, suppress opportunities. But you said something else. It can suppress people's lives. It does. They need, they need that medicine. They need the human contact. People. People die from poverty. People die from the way. People die from the lack of access. And so this is a this is not only a, a it's not even a game. This is deadly stuff. This is deadly, deadly to our democracy, deadly to individuals. And Mitch McConnell is right at the center of it. And he and we know no matter how quiet he moves around, and sometimes he says, you know, well, I don't necessarily agree with the president. Well, we wouldn't know that because you don't ever say that. You don't ever do anything to stop what he's doing. So then you are complicit. Right? Yes. Talk is cheap. And that's what he does. He talks. But his actions don't line up. That's Talk right. is cheap. And, you know, silence is compli compliance. That's compliance. That's and we right. won't be silent anymore. And we need to get on the phone. And we need to make those calls to that that's office. Right. Well, Darlene, I think folk have heard you from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, and you know, I would love to talk to you all day long, but I know the work you do, know the, the, that you are a powerful member of this campaign. We're standing with the people of Kentucky and the folk from, as T Tanya says, from the hood to the hollow can make a difference in Kentucky and across the world. Thank you for, for being on today. Thank you so much. I want to ask us right now. Thank you so much. We have a guest that she's got to get back to some things, but just real quickly for this two or three minutes. Uh, in fact, what I want to do is first bring on Debbie because I want her to hear Debbie. Debbie Smith, you have a rare health issue. You will not yeah. be able to vote in North November without the mail-in data. Tell us how you feel. And, and there's media on this call. Let them know as a Kentuckian the problem you have with Mitch McConnell, his misery, his mayhem, and his meanness, and that he's not, number one, passing a bill that would be compassionate and just, but also in not doing that, he's undermining the very thing you need to, to participate in the democracy. Talk to us real quickly, Debbie. Yes, and I'm glad to be on this call. And the irony here is I was supposed to be on the ballot in November, and I may not now be able to vote on um, in November in, on a ballot that I was supposed to be on. So I was going to run for um, 
for state senate in Kentucky because mm -hmm. of my health care issues and because um, through the advo advocacy work that I've done over the past three years, um, I've just developed this ethos that it's it's time for the impacted to lead. And gotcha. there are a lot of people in the state of Kentucky who are very impacted by uh, the policies that Mitch McConnell stands for or that he refuses to stand for. Um, so here's my issue. Three summers ago, I lost my job and my health insurance the same week that I was diagnosed with lupus. Mm -hmm. um, it was the same summer that they tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act three times. If they would have repealed, and I'm a single parent, so if they would have repealed the Affordable Care Act, I would not have been able to afford insurance again once I obtained employment again. Um, so I went to D.C. and I um, occupied Mitch McConnell's office um, during the first attempt to repeal and I took a rest in his office. And then I've, I've been That's a right. health advocate ever since. So um, that healthcare advocacy led me to where I wanted to step up and run. Um, but then late last year, I was diagnosed with a very rare lung disorder associated with lupus. It's called shrinking lung syndrome. There's not even a doctor who specializes in treating it. It has been very complex. I am employed now and I do have health insurance, but it has taken eight months to get the medication that I need approved. It is now being delayed and being delivered to me because of the tie up with the postal service. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm, so, so let, let me, let, let me make sure people, I, I want to uh, hear that. You had you diagnosed with lupus. Yes. Your Senator Mitch McConnell was supporting overturning the Affordable Care Act and the portion that provided and said you could still have health care even if you had a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you do that as part of my daughter has, well, almost all of us have some form, but yours in particular, that means that if he had gotten his way, it would literally have put your life totally at risk. Completely. Because you would not, not been able to. I got you. Okay. Completely at risk, yes. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't have to risk my life to cast my vote when I've been mm -hmm. in these streets working and working and working to help give other poor people a voice. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Kentucky, it's one of the poorest states in, in America. We have the highest rate mm -hmm. of childhood, um, childhood homelessness. Uh, my mother will be on with, with Mitch day. McConnell. Yeah, yeah. With, with Mitch McConnell being the majority leader, <laughs> yeah. your state, but all the policy is one of the, the poorest states because the policies he supports actually yeah. are against what poor and lower people need. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, take yeah. about thirty more seconds and hold on. Don't leave because I got to bring somebody on, but I want you to hold on with Darlene and some other. But give me thirty more seconds of what you really want to say to people. Well, well, what I really want to say is I have lobbied a whole bunch of legislators and every single one of them, the thing that I that they tell me, aside from your vote, and your vote is very important, is to call and to show up. You can't show up because of COVID, but call and um, make your voice heard and make your voice heard that you want to be able to mail in your ballot. Because I know there's a lot of people like me who cannot take the health risk to go to the ballot in November when we're going to have the pandemic plus. Um, it's supposed to be a worse flu year this year as well, and people will have those together. Um, so people mm -hmm. can't be risking their lives to cast their vote. That's not what America is about. Let's be fair and just. That's right. Well, it's a sick system, and I tell you what, I heard at your last thing, I heard the tinge of you sick and tired of being sick and tired. I heard in your voice that you're not playing with this, and people like you are not playing. And, and from Darlene to Debbie, you all need to understand, don't y'all mistake that smile, because they are it's serious about these issues and about challenging McConnell and challenging people who are putting all of us at risk, uh, who are just extremists that are using power to get everything for their, themselves and their kind and then hurt the rest of, rest of us. Look, focus on Mitch McConnell today. Call in, call in, call in, s sign up, register to vote. Last couple of weeks, we had a half million people shut down every line. He might be on vacation, but the line still registered. They don't know. And other people are getting the message by us calling them. Other senators are getting the message and they are starting to, 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 to do some trembling too. I'm getting word from the inside. So let's, let's, let's do this. This is a, this is an old time in city and y'all know I was going to come to it with a new Jack City twist. In other words, if we could, we'd be there on Pennsylvania. We'd be there in the Russell building. We'd be in his office everywhere. We can't do that. So we're doing it this way, but I might have a surprise for you at the end because we might. 
do a drive-by, not a drive-by shooting, but we might have to put <laughs> folk in Kentucky in cars and go by his house and honk every horn we have and holler and scream. But the thing we're not going to do is be silent anymore. And there's a sister, I'm going to come back to Karen, but there's a sister, she took a break from some things she was doing to come in and join us. She's been fighting and on the front lines uh, uh, of her career. She's never let her celebrity keep her out of the fight. In fact, she's used her celebrity to get in the fight. And she wanted to come on for a few minutes and tell people from all over the world, all over the nation to join her. She's calling in Jane Fonda, my dear sister, Jane Fonda. It's been a great supporter of the Poor People's Campaign. We've been great supporters of her, her, her Friday calls about environment. We're putting all this together. Jane, talk to us a little bit. Let me see you on the screen. I'm on the screen, right? There she is. There she is. Can you hear me? Good to be with you, Reverend Barber. I'm glad to hear your voice so strong. You're hanging in there. Yeah, I'm Jane Fonda, and I'm with Fire Drill Fridays and Greenpeace, and I'm telling you, we need to rise up like a disturbed hornet's nest and make the Trump administration sorry they ever thought to mess with the U.S. post office. The post office is ours. We pay for it with our taxes, right, Reverend Barber? It's in the Constitution. It's essential for the smooth running of a democracy. And you've just been hearing how people depend on it, especially up in those creeks and hollers of Kentucky. Those people there, I'm glad that they were there on, on here. It's really good to hear the sisters from Kentucky. But all over this country, people depend for bills and checks and medicine and voting ballots. <laughs> you know something? Are you aware that they, they were carting off those blue, you know, those big blue iconic mailboxes that are screwed into the ground? Mm -hmm. People were unscrewing mm -hmm. them and carrying them away, putting them in trucks, hundreds of them, those iconic carts. Well, they were doing it in, in, uh, in Montana. And plus the sorting machines, they were planning to remove 671 sorting machines from the post office. But the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, said that they stopped doing that. And they stopped doing taking away the post office boxes in, in, in um, Montana and other places. You know why? Because people found out what was happening and they protested. It's the absolute proof that protests work. They got in touch with their senators, both the Democrat and the Republican and their members of Congress, and asked them to insist that the post office stop taking away the, the mailboxes. And it worked. They did. Protest rising up. It works. I love what you said about that hornet's nest. That's that's right down my alley. You know, I'm from. Oh, I'm from know. That's right. It, there comes a time you got to sting somebody. I mean, there comes a time. And <laughs> Miss McConnell. And 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 they so they they stop taking out the 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 sorting machines. Which I mean, they sure like thirty three thousand an hour or something. It's hard to sort mail without mm -hmm. those sorting machines. They that's were taking right. it away. And as as speakers have said already, there are twenty five billion dollars that's supposed to go to the U.S. Postal Service is in the HEROES Act. And it we have to get that passed. We have to get the Postal Service funded. We also have to get unemployed people, that's $600. We also have to get states and counties the money that's in the HEROES Act so they won't be laying off million, millions more people. We have to protest. And Congress that's and right. senators and congressmen are sensitive. You know, they don't want to be seen as being opposed to the Postal Service because they know how popular it is. They don't want to be the bad guys. So let's make Mitch McConnell the bad guy that he is. Let's make everybody understand what a bad guy he is. <clears throat> Maybe we could do the same for Susan. Oh, oh, and deep. Moscow Mitch, yeah, right? right. Uh, Moscow oh. Mitch, that's right. But we call him, we, we like to, he, his meanness, his mayhem, his misery. Mitch McConnell is in, come out of Kentucky, but he's bad for this country. And Jane, what we want folk to understand is while all of the senators are, he holds that, that, that Senate in check. If he says he has the power to put a bill in a drawer and never bring it out. And I'm going to show a video right now in just a second. But the reason why they are screwing up those those blue iconic mailboxes because they want to screw up the vote. Let's be clear. This is about the fact that poor and low wealth people in this country, as you rightly said, 
We did a study, and that study said that anywhere from 1 to 19%, that's all. You don't need 20%, 21, 22. If just 1 to 19% of poor and low-wealth people who didn't vote, who already registered to vote, would vote an agenda, would vote for their justice and vote for love and vote for all the things we talk about, they could fundamentally shift the Senate. The Senate is in play. Poor and low-wealth people can make the play, and they could change the presidential election. The only way it can be stopped is suppression. And and what most people, we used to think voter suppression was something targeted at just black people. What we're learning is a racist voter suppression, of which Mitch McConnell and others are, is also just a voter suppression. <laughs> and when it comes to protecting power, they will do anything. And it's not just Trump. That's why we focused on McConnell. I'm so glad that you were able to come on today because your voice is so important. And you're right. You've always said it's about the people about us protesting, but I'm going to use that one like a hornet's nest. you got to sting somebody. you got yeah. to let them know. There's one more thing I want to add, because the other day, President Obama said something really interesting. He said that the one way that people can really help during this election is to become a poll watcher. He said it could be hugely important because states are looking for poll workers. See, mm -hmm. poll workers are usually older people, and with the COVID, they're very vulnerable. So we need, you can be 16 years or older as long as That's you're right. young, younger and healthy and a U.S. citizen. You can Google your state. Like I would Google California. Right. Then I would put in be becoming a poll worker and it'll give you the information. That's and right. you have to do it soon because tra you're trained and it takes a little time. And That's time right. is of the essence, right, Reverend? That's right. We don't well, have that's exactly right. And we've, we've got a voter protection plan and we've got people organized. We just organized hundreds this weekend. And, and, and what, and, 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 and part of also watching the poll is making these calls to Mitch McConnell because we got to make sure not only do people have access to the poll because he's blocking that money too. He's also blocking the money that the, that the election boards need to facilitate in person voting. So he's doing it both ways. He's blocking that money. He's blocking the money for the post office. He is is, is the accomplice. Uh, he's an, uh, 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 an accomplice with Donald Trump. He likes to be quiet and in the background. But I want you to check this out, Jane, and, and, and I want you to retweet it when we send it to you. Rob, put it up, this video. McConnell was in a room, quiet by himself, with some other people, some funders. And he said that as, if he was the last man standing, he would be the Grim Reaper. And none of those things would pass. Now, what was he talking about? He called them socialists. He was talking about health care, talking about living wages. He was talking about restoring uh, the Voting Rights Act because he lied when he stood over John Lewis's body, said how much he respected him. But he wouldn't even pass the Voting Rights Act, which John Lewis asked him to do before he died. So we called him what he called himself, the Grim Reaper. And we got to keep our eye on him. We got to push him. We got to protest. We got to fight for this democracy. It's coming up right now. Jane, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Jane Fonda, y'all. Stay strong. Put, put that video up. Are we still going to be a competitive place? Are we still going to be the kind of place where you can realize your ambitions and your energy? But if you aren't able to do that, there's still ways to lead a rewarding life. Are we going to turn this into a socialist country? Don't assume it cannot happen. It'll all be in the hands, I think, of the voters of this uh, country next year. If you share my view, and I hope you do, that that's not what we want America to be like in the future, let me tell you this. If I'm still the majority leader of the Senate, think of me as the grim reaper. None of that stuff is going to pass. None of it. So, we got a big job to do next year. Obviously, we get the House back. That takes care of it. If the President gets reelected, that takes care of it. Uh, but I guarantee you, if I'm the last man standing and I'm still the majority leader, it ain't happening. I promise you, it's not happening. Thank you. That's an arrogant, mean person. Now, I know you talk, to say literally, first of all, you don't know if you're going to be alive. None of us do. But to literally say, if I'm the last man standing, I'm going to be the one to use my power, not to help people, but to, but to block health care, to block voting rights, to block living wages, and then to call it socialist. And rather than talking about it's what people need, but he is 
a corporate socialist because he makes sure that corporations get every dime, here's somebody talking, gets every dime they want to and even every dime they don't want. Tanya, I know that you don't have long to be with us, uh, but just for a quick second before I go to Karen, how do you feel when you hear that? And what do you say to people about why all around this country and especially all over Kentucky, we got to put pressure on Mitch McConnell. We've got to call in. We've got to write in. We've got to do, do this, this modern day form of, of sit-in uh, using t technology and we've got to register everybody to vote and we've got to turn out the vote. Tana, talk to us just quickly before I go to Karen. You better believe it from the hood to the holler. You know, the Grand Reaper, he also, he's in the shadows, but he also has a hood on his head. And so that's just to have his face. But he is no good for the people in Kentucky. You heard what he just said. What I want to say is during the moral march, we went to Covington, Kentucky. Karen's from Covington, Kentucky. We went over to his office. I want the people and the viewers to know that we were talking about taxes and tax paying tax dollars. Well, we in Kentucky pay the taxes for the office that he's in in Northern Kentucky. And I wanted them to know that during our march, we could not even get into the office. His okay. office sits on private land and the person who owned that building put us off his land and we could not even go into his building. That is a darn shame. He is supposed to be representing each and every one of us and we can't even have access to him. I'm begging you all, flood his offices stop his business of the day he's on vacation i'm in the hospital and a lot of people around here with poor health care cannot even get into the office into the hospital and we need everybody to flood those towels right now stand up mailing your your ballot he's doing everything they must be running scared there's a friend of mine by the name of Shelton McElroy. He says the reason why they are so afraid, if voting was not so important, they wouldn't be trying so hard to keep us from voting and getting to the ballot. That's what I want to say from the hood to the holler. Let's stand together. Let's lock arms like we've been doing. Let's stand up. We've got so much to stand up for. And if you do not vote, we cannot change anything. He is, it's time to put him in his rocking chair. I don't want to say any bad words, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Send him home. He needs to, I don't even know if he's got great grandkids, but he needs to be there with him. He is bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You, 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 you're serious about this from the, from the hospital bed and, and, and telling the truth. You know, forget all the Democrat and Republican all stuff. What this man, this stuff we're seeing for him is just mean. It's like, I got some power. I don't know who hurt him when he was young, but I got some power and I'm going, I'm just going to be mean. I'm just going to hold bills. I'm just going to hurt you. And what's so ugly about it, he's willing to hurt the very people that put him in office. He's hurting the people of Kentucky, right? That's right. Uh, and, 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 and you want to be a public politician, but then you hide out. You hide out in private, but then you want to undermine the public post office. You want to undermine the public having health care, the public having living wages. I mean, this is just been, and it's something really, you know, we'll deal with this later uh, in, in the year, next year, hopefully, because we somehow we got to review all this power that we've allowed one office or one person to have or one position to have. You know, that stuff grows out of compromises that were made when the Constitution was signed and those compromises were made to bring Southern states in, you know, so that the, the public, excuse the population, could always kind of be put in check. That's a longer story, Rob. I won't get into all of that. But the bottom line is, those of you all that are out there, it, and I like to if, 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 and hear what Thomas said a thousand times, if our voting was weak, they would not be invested all this time. If our power was not there, they know it better than we do. We have to know it more than they do. That's what all of this is about. And so, Tana, thank you so much. Thank you. And you've already introduced our dear sister. We love you. We're praying for you. We know you're a fighter. And you've already said Karen from uh, I was there. You know, they called the cops on us. They didn't just say, would you all please leave? They called the cops on us. In fact, the only thing that was that one of the cops happened to be somebody who didn't like McConnell. 
<laughs> you know, he, he was on duty, so he did his duty just a little bit. But, you know, they actually called the cops on that. But Karen Weatherby, you, you, you're from, from Covington, right there where that office is. Uh, your story is similar to Debbie. You're from Kentucky. Talk to us about why from Kentucky and why you with this campaign and why you are saying the people make these calls, why you're saying the people to register to vote and why you're saying the people don't just train all of your attention on, on Donald Trump. You have to know what Mitch McConnell is doing and call him out for it. Karen? Oh, where where on my soapbox do I get started? Um. <laughs> We need a post office. Uh, I'll walk to the post office to to do what I need to do. So please leave my post office. Um, you know, we have such a health care crisis um, in Kentucky and all over the United States. But um, Mitch McConnell is allowed to is approved to have St. Elizabeth Hospital, the only hospital in Northern Kentucky. So we have no no competition. I live right across the river from Cincinnati. It takes the ambulance just as long to take me to Christ as it does to take me to St. Elizabeth. But because the city of Covington decided that they don't want their money going across the river, they no longer will take me to Christ Hospital. And St. Elizabeth almost killed me twice. Um, and then when I met you, Reverend Barber, I had gone to the hospital in an ambulance in my nightgown. And they wouldn't provide me a way home. And I, um, they told me I had to leave, and I thought that was wrong, so I called the police, and the police came out, and the nurse got the police before they came to see me, and they gave me a choice. I could either go to jail, or I could leave the property, and once I left the prop, so I got up and left in my nightgown at three o'clock in the morning, and once I got off the property, this car comes around and propositions me. And I was headed to the cemetery to hide behind a grave so that nobody would see me till daylight because I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk two miles home in Covington in a nightgown. And um, I, my phone had and died. Mitch McConnell I, in your state. Yeah, he's in my and, state. And Mitch McConnell has been blocking, and, and some of he's trying to undo health care. And you know this stuff personally. I can see it. I hear it in your voice. If anything, he should be a senator trying to expand health care. That's right. He should care about us. And you know what? You, you say to call, but Mitch McConnell doesn't delete his voicemails. So all you do is get the voicemails full. So, you know, well, he, 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 he reminds us in every way that he can. He, right. he doesn't care about people, That's you know. Right. But the power of them calling is it goes through that switchboard, it gets noted, and it's spreading all over that this is happening. Okay. Uh, and he does not like it. It's spreading all over the thousands of people from Kentucky and around this country. And politicians believe you. They may do things to try to ignore you, but they pay attention. And he knows that his election, for instance, it might have been back in the day he could win by 12, 14 percentage points, but that's over. Now, we're not endorsing any candidate. We're talking about people getting involved. And I'm trying to tell you all the truth is, the truth is that poor and low-wealth people can decide, can decide literally who is the senator from Kentucky, who controls the United States Senate, and what kind of But well, we have to know that, and we have to tell And we don't have to wait until Election Day. Right now, we need to call and register they get. They know what's going on now. You know where we would be because we'd be with you. If it wasn't for COVID, we'd be right there in the office, and we'd have every news camera that was right there exposing how kids wanting to protect corporations rather than protect people like you is literally causing people heartache and causing people to die and causing people to have all kinds of pain. Am I right about that? You're exactly right about that. And you know it's. It's sad when you're elderly to 
to think this should be my last happy days, you know, mm-hmm. and so many burdens that he puts on us makes it hard to be happy, you know, and um, it's time for a change. And I, I'll tell you what, I walk around, I make sure everybody's registered. Um, I have a hard time talking people into voting, but I am so sick that this is the first time I voted by mail and it worked successfully. And I, if they only have one voting place in Kenton County, I need to mail in my vote. That's right. You need to. And he knows, uh, uh, as we as we thank you so much for coming up, he knows that there are thousands and millions of people just like you in this country. He and their political political um, uh, operatives, they know it. It's not just Trump. They know it. And they know that they can only survive and win by, 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 by weakening the voting population, uh, by lessening the number of people. They cannot survive and expand the vote. That's what they fear. Uh, people who are engaged in racism and classism and, and warmongering, they don't believe in democracy. They really don't believe in democracy. And, and they especially don't believe in democracy when more people not like them can are participating. Uh, they will undermine it. They will undermine it. They want the facade of democracy. But this is blatant. This is open. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be and I want to say that as an African American from the South, it's important to say uh, that, you know, um, we have these problems and normally with voter suppression, they talk just about black people. But the fact of the matter is a voter suppressionist that's racist eventually will suppress everybody's vote that wants to move forward and challenge the issues of racism and poverty. And that's what we're doing. Thank you so much, Karen, for being Thank on. You. You, you're such a such a blessing to us. I know we're getting close, Rob. I know I'm looking right at the, the screen. Talk to me a little bit real quickly about how many people, I'm going to take an extra 10 minutes real quickly, but talk to me about how many people are on and what you're seeing out there with the numbers. We have thousands of people on. We've we've broken about every uh, system we have. And so for folks who are who are online, please go to the link that's on the on the page right now. It's 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 a uh, it's hyperlinked in the comments as well, uh, which will help get you connected to the site. And if you if you're on there already, just refresh the page so that you can get to the right place. And if you uh, and so okay. and then there's going to be a petition there as well for you to call them uh, to send in a note to McConnell. And then we also want to hear your stories in the uh, in the uh, chat right now uh about what what you're telling mcconnell when you call in just go ahead and tell us uh, what you're telling him why why he needs to get back to dc to get his relief package why we need the postal service go ahead and put, uh, drop it in the chat um and then if you can't get mcconnell call your friends to make sure they're registered to vote so uh, and then call all week because we know he'll, he'll be more open tomorrow that's right don't don't stop yara i want you to get ready sarah anderson and and reverend janelle bruce i want y'all to come on together and I, I want to ask each of you, Sarah's with the Institute for Policy Studies, to take one minute and say to everybody this is why they must understand what's at stake, not only by blocking uh, this cares that we, this hero that, that we actually think should be far more. We should think it should be far more. But we are, but, 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 but what McConnell wants to do is give far less than what already is not enough. And that is unacceptable. But why is it, Sarah, you, you, this post office issue is so important, so damning what they're doing. And then Reverend Janelle, if you could take that, that, that strong one minute, you're a preacher in the street, you're a lawyer about, and you've been through COVID and about why this challenging McConnell, it means so much and why you're calling on people to do it. And then Yara, I want you to be ready to go and just uh, uh, give us something. It might not even be a whole song. It might be a, a line you want to sing, something you want to do, but I want you to be led by the Spirit on that. Come on, Sarah and Reverend Janelle, get up on the screen together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Reverend Barber. It's great to be with you. There are three huge things at stake in the fight over the future of the Postal Service. Essential services. Postal workers are frontline essential workers right now, delivering medication, food, all the kinds of things that people need to get by, especially for the poor, rural, elderly who rely on the Postal Service more than anyone else. Secondly, our democracy is at stake uh, because the Postal Service is being sabotaged from within. Uh, The point of that is to ruin people's confidence in the Postal Service uh, for the vote by mail option that we all need and good jobs. 
uh, postal workers are not rich, but they make decent pay and benefits, and those salaries support communities across this country. It's been a particularly critical uh, path to the middle class for African Americans. People of color make up 40% of the postal workforce, and this should absolutely not be a partisan issue. 90% of Republicans support financial relief for the Postal Service. The House is calling back their members this weekend to vote to repeal the disastrous service cuts that the new Postmaster General, Trump's ally, has put through. Mitch McConnell has not lifted a finger. Big, a finger. He put zero cents in his COVID relief proposal for the Postal Service. The House has already passed $25 billion. We need to absolutely demand that McConnell take action to save our public postal service. And he, as that one person, people need to remember, because I got a lot of pushback on Twitter. They said, but it's the rest of them too. But what we've learned by examining the power structure is the power of a majority leader. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Give us one example, Sarah, of that, the, the, the sheer power of the majority leader as it exists now and why, yes, it's the others, but why you have to target and push the majority leader. He is the key obstacle in between the demands that we've all been pushing for and actually seeing them in law. The House passed months ago an, amb an ambitious relief bill that includes $25 billion so that the Postal Service can continue serving all Americans at affordable uniform rates, help binding together this country. Mitch McConnell is standing in the way of that becoming law. Uh, Trump waffles around a lot, but recently he has said that if a package arrives on his desk with money for the Postal Service, he will not veto it. Mitch McConnell is the key to saving our public postal service. Yeah, and I don't even believe Trump on that. You know, if he's saying that there's something in it that we gotta watch, and that's why it needs to be a part of the whole package, because I believe in some ways they want a lot of disruption uh, in this election in November, because, you know, Trump would call an, an, a national emergency. You know, he, you know, there's some possibilities he could do that, even though we voted even during the time of war. But, but am I right, Sarah, to say Mitch McConnell has the sheer power as majority leader that he can take a piece of legislation, put it in his desk and never bring it out. Absolutely. And there are Republicans in the Senate who want him to do the right thing. Quite a, a number of them have been speaking out and that's because of the public pressure, the outcry over the weekend as people realize that the fox is in the hen house now at the Postal Service. Trump's friend and fundraiser is the head of the Postal Service and he is working to sabotage it. And the mail slowdowns around the country, people are seeing it every day. They're seeing their postal boxes disappear. And uh, Mitch McConnell could step in and correct this problem, take swift action. He's got the power to do it. And his state is one of the ones that is most reliant on the Postal Service. 42% of Kentuckians uh, live in rural areas um, where people, and, and uh, it's one of the poorest states. Uh, those groups of people tend to not have high speed internet and they have to rely on the Postal Service to do their bill paying, pay, to get their checks. And the, so but, if he doesn't even care right. about the rest of the country, he should care about his own constituents. Well, <laughs> well, he care. He, he he might would care about them if he thought they would vote for him. You know, they just they just changed the reality uh, in the governorship, and he knows that poor and low wealth people are organizing mm -hmm. from the hood to the hollow, and so he he has reason to fear. But the bottom line is, he is a suppressionist. He just like he is, he's refused to fix the Voting Rights Act for over twenty six hundred days. Let us not forget that we call Strom Thurmond a racist because he filibuster the 1957 Civil Rights Act for one day. McConnell has refused to fix the Voting Rights Act for over 2,600 days, over 2,600 days. And so we have to push them. Secondly, Sarah, it's important that people remember in terms of black people, post office jobs and serving in those jobs and serving as directors in state during the days of reconstructions were the first government jobs that many African-Americans would receive. Yeah. You know, and we don't often talk about that history in terms of the post office was seen as critical during the Revolutionary War to getting information to the people. It was seen as critical during the Reconstruction Movement and critical during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, so because getting information to the people is the way an informed people can then be an inspired people and then be an engaged people. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much for all that you do. Janelle, 
you know, you fought, your family fought through COVID. Uh, you've ministered to people on the streets and, uh, uh, you know, you are a preach preacher and a, and a poor pit preacher, uh, you know, a lawyer and, and a prophet. So talk to us a little bit about what kind of righteous indignation do you have around seeing what McConnell is doing? It's really real. Um, what Sarah just said at the end, she mentioned folks not having access to high speed Internet, things that certain people take for granted. So you have folks who are poor, folks who are low income, who actually rely on mail to pay their bills. So here we are already struggling in a pandemic to make sure the lights stay on, to make sure the water stays on. And yet you have folks who are using the mail systems now being hit with late fees and saying that, uh, you know, their bills didn't arrive on time. So on top of the 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 pandemic of of COVID on top of the pandemic of poverty, we now are now facing even more stressors from being hit with $30, $50, even $100 late fees that folks are now facing because of the slowdown. So this issue affects things. We heard uh, my sister talk about not being able to get her medicine, literally a matter of life or death. So all of these things are so connected. And if McConnell doesn't act, poor people, black, white, rural people, we are going to continue to experience the devastation. And we're going to continue to go deeper and deeper. And this hole that, that we're being sent into is, is horrible. It's scary. And it's going to be detrimental. It is detrimental to our democracy. It just makes sense. Even um, the amount of money that states have received to effectively do mail-in voting is insufficient. It's only going to help with 10 to 20 percent of the ballots, 10 to 20 percent, which means states are going to be left with the burden of financing mail-in voting. So what does that mean? Programs are going to be cut. Social programs are going to be cut. Food programs are going to be cut. Those things that poor people need the most are going to be cut, and states are going to have to wrestle with, do we provide mail-in voting, or do we provide food to our people who are starving? We are in a huge crisis and it is so connected and we as the people have to rise up. But I also need us to recognize the power that we are having. If you notice that uh, the hearing for the, the post office was originally supposed to happen in September, but the pressure and I believe it was the, <laughs> right. the people that caused this hearing to be moved up to August 24th. So we need to continue putting the pressure on our legislators. Let them know we are watching. Let them know we will not be silent and let them know we are paying attention to how they are acting. That's right. Mitch McConnell's mayhem, misery, and meanness, and you're in Maryland. So you I'm know he Maryland. comes out of Kentucky, he's hurting people all over this country. He is he this suppressing of the vote, he's suppressing people's lives, suppressing people's opportunity, suppressing people's medicine delivery, uh women, all for power, for just pure power. That's what makes it so mean. You know, this this is a willingness to hurt and undermine democracy. And guess what? As you said, um, Janelle, if this if, if the bottom continues to fall out, the whole society is going to be hurt. So if you 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 allow this to happen to poor and low wealth people, but it's going to happen to everybody. And there are millions of people in the midst of COVID who are sick, who are not poor and low wealth. But if you think you, if the goal is you're targeting poor and low wealth people, black and brown people, and because you're scared of them going to the polls, you're scared of, scared of them participating because you don't want an expanded electorate. What happens is in your target of one people or groups of people, you hurt everybody. And Americans should just be outraged at any one person having this kind of power. And that's why we said on these moral Mondays on Mitch McConnell, this, this New Jack City way of doing an old time of sit in is that you cannot just keep talking about Trump. You've got to deal with Trump. You've also got to deal with this guy who called himself the Grim Reaper, who said, if I'm the last one standing, just make sure I'm the majority leader and I'll make sure that none of these quote unquote things get through. Oh, it's time to stand up. It's time to be fight back, don't you? I, I, I might even do a little bit of my mouth on the day as I remember, don't you believe it's just Trump? But if you believe it's just Trump, you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled, you've been fooled. It's not just Trump, it's the system of suppression, and we have the power to stand up and fight. Don't ever doubt that. That's what they want you to believe. Yara, it's the end of our time together. We need people to keep calling. West Coast, it's your time now. We need the West Coast move to be moving now. We need you to call. We need you to sign up. We need you to let them feel you. Don't worry about going to the voicemail. Put it on the voicemail. Don't worry about whether the staff is there. They're reporting. People are hearing. 
you all know on these small Mondays, I kind of get inside of my old radio disc jockey, old way of talking, because at the end of the day, we're trying to move, they're trying to move, trying to move a movement. This is not about a moment. It's about a movement. It's about pressure. It's about pushing. It's about penetrating and breaking through uh, of the walls of, 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 uh, that, that are put up in the political structure. They can't be in the streets. Uh, so we can't be in this office, but we can do it this way through digital and we can build. Everybody that you, you call, if you go to our website, we also capture your information so you can stay in touch, so we can stay in touch with you because we're going to fight to get people, we're going to fight going to the election, we're going to fight at the ballot box and through mail voting, uh, we, whatever we do, if we have to stay out of work on election day, we're going to do it, and then we're going to fight after the election day because we're going to keep pushing until this country addresses the issues that face all of us. Liz is on, I know, I don't know if she has the things she wants to say before we close out, but Yara, let me see your face up. You got something in your heart today. I just want you to drop it, whatever it is. And Rob, that's the last word when, when Yara gives her, her last note to us as we are doing what we're doing today. Thank y'all, we'll be right back here next Monday. That leads us into the, so the Republican convention. We got some surprises for you next Monday of people uh, not only impact the people who are the most powerful and the leaders, but some other people are saying, look, I want to be a part of it. Been talking to Hill Harper, been talking to Mark Ruffalo, been talking to folks who are saying, we're glad somebody's doing this. And so listen, y'all, this is Mar Monday. And there's no such thing as a Mar Monday. Once you start, you stay with it. Just forward together, not one step back. This is Mar Monday, National Mar Monday, March on Mitch McConnell, mayhem, his meanness, his misery. An old style city in an old style call man with a new Jack City twist. That's what we're doing. Yara. Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Well, then register somebody. Don't you want to vote? I said, register somebody. Don't you want to vote? Register somebody. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Oh, they're trying to take our rights away. Don't you want to vote? They're trying to take our rights away. Don't you want to vote? They're trying to take our rights away. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Well, then come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? I said, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I'm going to vote. I said, yes, I'm going to vote. I said, yes, I'm going to vote. All right, y'all are up. Yay! Yes. Amen. Amen. So we're in gallery view now, and you can see all these beautiful people that have come on today uh, from, especially we thank our uh, family from Kentucky, Debbie and Darlene and Pam and Tana. Uh, and who else am I missing there? Um, Karen as well. And for all the leadership there, we look forward to having some folks back from Kentucky next week. Uh, we are uh, just got word that the, the calls are now going through. The switchboard is open, so please go and go ahead and keep calling uh, the uh, Mitch McConnell's office to get that passed. And I want to pass it on now to see if Reverend Liz has anything before we close out with a little music that we can rock out to. Yes, so thanks so much uh, to Rob, to everyone for tuning in, and indeed to our, our siblings in Kentucky. Um, 
our siblings in the postal office uh, service, as well as as everyone that's fighting across this nation. I just wanted to to use um, some words that have been inspiring me lately from um, the late John Lewis, uh, who is with us in spirit this week and all weeks. Um, he said that we had no choice because at an early age, we recognized the wrong under which we were forced to live. And we swore to God that by God's grace, we would do whatever God called us to do in order to put on the table of the nation's agenda that this must end. That's what we're doing here on the Moral Monday March to McConnell, challenging his mayhem, his misery, and his meanness. Um, That's what people all across this nation that are a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, have pledged to do, not just for one election season, for our lifetime, um, in in order to be able to put on this nation's agenda and on its its, uh, tables that this must end. This violence against our postal workers must end. This attack on our democracy must end. This killing um, and dying, unneeded death must end. And we can do it when we work together. So please keep on calling. We we need you to, to send that message, that strong message to McConnell. And we need uh, to keep on turning up here on Moral Mondays and and every day of the week as we organize, organize, organize and build a strong and mighty movement that says this must end. Everybody's got a right to to live. Somebody's been hurting our people. It's gone on for far too long and we won't be silent anymore. Thank you, Reverend Liz. We appreciate it. Uh, One more piece after this, but while you're on our website, make sure you go to the voting page, the take action and go to our more page which gives you an opportunity to register to vote or find out how to register to vote if your state doesn't do online registration. And also how to plug in to our more campaign. We're going to have more teams that are going to be uh, doing this work all over the country uh, in the the next 80 days. I want to ask Lamonique and uh, Kazimir to come on and just give a little report that we've seen in the chats of the engagement that we've seen and what they have to say and what uh, uh, they can close us out. And then we'll we'll end with a a good song, uh, New and Unsettling Force. Sure, we have quite a bit of uh, chat going on on Facebook. So we have people who have been directly affected. We have uh, Terry Blayton, who says, I'm an essential worker at a gas station at 63 years old. And the HEROES Act might affect me. I've showed up every shift scheduled. Our people need help in Kentucky. And we see also voter suppression enacting. Uh, Trisha Tripler Schaefer says voter suppression in South Dakota, as well as our indigenous population on reservations, cannot use their tribal IDs to vote. Also, law changed in February 2020 that needed street addresses to register, which most of our reservation doesn't have. We see the interconnections. We also see folks who have uh, family members who work in the post office. A step in pain, Gwen Gibson says, yes, my grandfather was a postmaster. His salary, the farm, and my grandmother's small business kept them afloat during the the depression. So when you, when you attack the U.S. post office, you're seeing family members affected, you're seeing essential workers affected, you're seeing our indigenous population affected. It's all affected. And that's why we're fighting to protect the U.S. Postal Service. Yes, Kashmir. And I'll, I'll just add that I, I was in the YouTube chat and people are disgusted. Um, people are disgusted that Mitch McConnell would go on vacation when so many of our people, so many of the people who he represents are in crisis right now while he is on vacation. Right now, people are in crisis. Angela Gardner said, we need Medicare for all. There are too many elected officials in all levels of government taking money from for-profit hospitals and insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies which is why people like Karen suffer. We don't want to see our people suffer. We don't want to see our family, our friends, and even people that we don't know suffer. And yet Mitch McConnell is on vacation. Corinne, you see, lives in Arizona, but she said that she still called and she left a message for Mitch. 
She says she's in Maricopa County and they are volunteering to bring the elderly and disabled to the ballot box or to the recorder's office. They are going to do whatever it takes, but they should not have to do so much when mail-in voting is available. They should not have to do so much. And I'll close with Sonia Sukolowski, who said that she called the Washington office and she's continuing to call. And Corinne, again, saying that she's never seen such abuses of government in her 70 years. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Thank you both for, for checking those out. I know there's uh, just a lot of powerful stories in there. I saw one person said they called 17 times. Uh, I would have uh, stopped keeping count uh, much earlier than 17, but that's some commitment. And so we uh, really appreciate uh, all that people have done. Uh, we hope you'll join us back again next week uh, for the Moral Monday. They're going to keep it up and keep up the pressure, uh, knowing that uh, 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 we're, we're going to fight until we get everything we need uh, for the people in uh in the United States and beyond. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, Sarah from the Institute for Policy Studies uh, for coming and Yara uh, for leading us again and Eric for doing some social media for us. And of course, Reverend Liz and Pam and all the friends from Kentucky. We'll close out with a new and unsettling force uh, from the 40 days in DC. Oh!